busy people. Today we are snooping around in other people's lives again as we count down through a list of the top 10 terrifying families that changed history forever. Changing history is a pretty big flex, but don't get it in your head that all changes are a large scale or affect everyone. For example, Tennessee Williams, who became famous for airing his family's dirty laundry on Broadway, being derided by critics and blacklisted by the Roman Catholic cardinals, who condemned his scripts as revolting, deplorable, morally repellent, and offensive to Christian standards of decency. And if he didn't have the terrifying family life that he did, he wouldn't have changed and challenged the course of Broadway. His mother's continual search for the perfect nuclear family life, his sister's deliberating schizophrenia, as well as his father's heavy drinking, abusive, and sometimes criminal nature, caused them to move around numerous times around in the St. Louis areas, locations that he would later use as inspiration for his work. And like the famous characters Blanche and Stanley from A Streetcar Named Desire, he was troubled and self-destructive, an abuser of substances like his father, and trying not to take his own life was a long-term struggle due to the trauma he had experienced. The character of Blanche is believed to be based off of his own sister Rose, who was diagnosed with schizophrenia alongside a few other mental disorders when she was in her early 20s. Williams witnessed how her illness weighed her, but also never forgave his parents for forcing a prefrontal lobotomy on her, now largely discredited as a medical treatment, and it incapacitated Rose for the rest of her life. Anguish over his sister's fate and his traumas took its toll on Williams' health. He battled depression for most of his life, and in 1969 he was hospitalized by his brother. After his release from the hospital in the 1970s, Williams wrote a few other plays, a memoir, poem, short stories, and a novel. In 1975, he, pem he published Memoirs, which detailed his life and discussed his addiction as well as his homosexuality. It'd only be a few years later before he's found and alone in a hotel room. You've heard about these guys on our channel before, the Boleyns, aka History's Nepo Babies. See, starting with Daddy Thomas Boleyn, this this noble spent his career sucking up the King Henry in order to wedge his kids all up in there. An insane decision as a parent seeing as King Henry was known for chopping heads off of ladies. First, Mary is tossed his way, but like Seinfeld in that Roommates episode, Henry wants the other one, Anne Boleyn. As Henry's obsession with Anne grew, so did Thomas's standing in court, and some have speculated that he pressured his daughter to insist on wedding the king, who was already married at the time. Henry says, don't worry about that baby, I got this, and literally subverts and rewrites a religion to divorce his initial wife Catherine and marry Mistress Anne, effectively establishing a new church of which he became the head and changing the course of history. Three years after the controversial marriage in 1535, Anne, having failed to produce a male heir, was also accused of adultery with not one, but five men, one of them being her own brother. Oh, and also plotting the king's assassination, and she fell out of favor. So her head got to fall off her body, classic history style. Anne's brother George had already been executed for his alleged involvement with Anne treasonable plot, and her sister Mary long since banished for having married for love. Their father Thomas lost his position as Lord Privy Seal and died a few short years later. And everyone knows the cons. You have to expect them in this list, honestly. Even if you've heard about them a thousand times, these guys manage to take the cake in so many categories of terrible that they just tend to circulate discussions regarding history. So, there is Genghis Khan, founder of the vast Mongol Empire, who was a visionary warrior and leader, rising to power power after successfully uniting all nomad tribes of Northeast Asia to dominate the green steppes of Mongolia. In 1206, juices flowing and feeling good about the invasion expansion stuff so far, he proclaimed the Mongol Empire and called himself Genghis Khan, the universal ruler, and moved to attack China and literally anywhere else he could find, expanding his empire to 12 million square miles of territory. Genghis and his sons also waged major wars on two fronts simultaneously and conquered Russia in winter. Both feats that eluded the also short and angry men Napoleon and Adolf. Before he died, Genghis Khan ordered his sons to split the empire in multiple khanates that would continue to push the boundaries of the empire. At the peak of its glory with his sons, it occupied most of Eurasia, spreading from Austria to Korea and from South Siberia to the Himalayans. The great Khan's descendants conquered nearly everything of interest, turning the Mongol Empire into the largest territory in history. Genghis Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan, founded the Yuan Dynasty in 1271, which then later ruled China until 1368. Stories like this one are the reason there's so many
many period dramas set in England, it is royal sibling rivalry. Before Meghan and Harry and all of their stuff, there were other scandals. But some forget about the brothers, George III and Edward, the Duke of Windsor. So, in the 1920s, George is married and a career naval officer while his brother Edward, why he's Prince of Wales, salacious fiend and international sex symbol. The bleep hit the fan when the buzzkill George learns his brother Edward is shaking it up with Wallace Simpson, who <gasps> is divorced twice. He snitches to daddy who makes a comment about when I'm dead the boy will ruin himself in 12 months. Anyways, so he manifests that and he dies and Edward is the oldest so he's tossed on the throne hot plate. He says, uh, okay, but can my girlfriend come? Seeing as being king literally means he's the head of the Anglican church, which has a no-no grounds on divorce, he was forbidden that. So by 1936, Edward is miserable. He misses his boo and the fun life and only about 325 days into his reign, he abdicates to George. Immediately after abdication, he becomes a gold digger divorcee. Wallace was never granted her HRH title, so Edward decided to spam call his little brother asking for that and money even though he had a loaded bank account. Meanwhile, George is busy trying to become a new king during the start of the Second World War. So since they also felt so snubbed by British royalty, Wallace and Edward decided to party with the Yahtzees during the start of World War II. That's a bad time if there were ever not one. At one point, Edward straight up hangs out with Adolf. So in 1940, as fears in England grew of Edward's apparent bestie ties with the enemy, he was offered governorship of the far off Bahamas. The Duke begrudgingly accepted he was forced and was shipped off and not allowed to return for a very long time. What's crazy is even as his brother was dying, Edward pestered him while he was on his deathbed to give Wallace the HRH title and money still. Get ready for a whole lot of Ivans. It's Ivan the Terrible and the Terrible Family. Just kidding, their last name isn't terrible. Or is it? I'm a history host, I should know. Uh, anyways, I think what made this family terrifying was being part of it because Ivan, the first Tsar of Russia, had a complex personality that contributed to his famous behavior and his nickname. Intelligent yet prone to outbreaks of uncontrollable rage from a young age, he faced constant threats from upsurfers to his throne after the deaths of both of his parents on his eighth birthday. Birthday. After his wife's death, Ivan sank into a depression that inspired a 24 year long reign of terror. After he seized absolute control, Ivan slayed any noble who spoke against him. He allegedly even blinded the architect of the St. Basilia Cathedral so that he could never create another building as beautiful, which is dramatic, sure, but it's also a hell of a compliment to your work. His nine children suffered through years of abuse at his hands. In 1581, he attacked his pregnant daughter in law as a punishment for wearing revealing clothing, and the woman unfortunately lost her baby. Ivan's son, Ivan, finds out what his dad did to his wife and is justifiably pissed, so he confronts him. His dad had already banished his first two attempted marriages, now he did this? Come on! Well, Daddy Ivan classically loses it, but went a little too far, and he smacked his kid on the head with a scepter. It kills him, and it essentially sets the clock for a political crisis known as the Time of Troubles that began with the extinction of the Rurik dynasty upon the infamous Friarda's death in 1598, and the deep population of Russian provinces from Tartar incursions. How keeping it in the family literally started a war and an empire downfall. Charles II and his family tree. The 17th century wasn't a great time to be a peasant. Agricultural production dropped, famine destroyed communities, and epidemics swept across Europe. But peasants were still better off than the Spanish Habsburgs in one important way. They weren't literally killing themselves off from intentional... <clears throat> family activities. Charles's father, King Philip III, was only 10 years old when his parents arranged his first marriage, which resulted in eight children. After the death of his first wife, Philip remarried his own niece and had two daughters and two more sons who died as children. Between 1527 and 1661, the year that this dumpy potato called Charles was born, the Spanish royal families produced 34 children. Nearly 30% of them died before the age of one, and a full half died before their 10th birth days. But poor leadership from the Habsburg also contributed to this country's issues and declines. The countries needed a functioning king and governing system and there was literally zero. The monarchy took on an enormous amount of debt while funding a multitude of war efforts in both Europe and the Americas and struggling with inflation. The king was simply unable to rule his kingdom, which would never again reach the heights of the 16th century. He couldn't speak, he was incapable of walking, his body and functions were all deformed, he couldn't even really be a human being. It was clear the 
but Charles wasn't going to live long and he had no children of his own, so in 1700, Charles issued his last will and testament. In the doctorate, Charles chose Philip, Duke of Anjou, but instead of a smooth succession, Charles' death led to the War of the Spanish Succession that dragged on from 1701 until 1713. Maybe Smooth Criminal was written because the family was full of them, the Jacksons. Oh yeah, you guys, I'm going there. This family is a disaster and I will die on this hill. So let's break it down. Since the early 80s, it's been one thing after another. The plastic surgery gossip, Sister Latoya's claims of what she and Mike went through as kids, allegations that were settled out of court in 1994 that Mike had maybe not done some so great things himself. Who better to marry Elvis's daughter? Joe Jackson, former boxer and failed blues musician, his main skill appeared to be devising innovative ways to make his children's lives miserable. Once you knew what Michael Jackson's childhood and early career had been like, the issue wasn't so much why he was apparently turning out so weird, but how it hadn't happened sooner. Even without their father's aggression, the Jacksons still would have dealt with their weird ass mama. <laughs> Devout Jehovah Witness, she had them pour over the watchtower illustrations of imminent Armageddon for funsies, and she would wash them with rubbing alcohol, making a family of extreme germaphobes. The Jackson Five, as they were to become, were not allowed to play outside with other children. They rehearsed for five hours a day after school, and their enthusiasm was incentivized by the fact that if they got a dance step wrong, their father would order them to break a branch off the tree in the garden for a switch. You guys remember that community episode? In his 40s, Michael was still telling reporters that the thought of his father made him nauseous. So dramatic it needs its own movie, and it actually has some. K-drama worthy King Suk Jong. This Korean lineage is captured in movies The Fatal Encounter and The Eternal Empire, so if any K-drama fans are watching, maybe jump on those. King Suk Jong was a pretty fickle dude, and he didn't take much to fall out of his favor. His first wife, Queen In Hoyeon, ticked him off, so he banished her. Then he married a side piece, Lady Jang. Her promotion led to a bloody conflict known as the Jeezy Sawa, which resulted in the Soron faction taking power in her son, Gyeon Jong, named Crown Prince. After a bit, the king started liking his next son, Yo Jan's mother, Lady Choi. Lady Choi was an open supporter of the previously banished old queen, and the king didn't need much convincing other than that. He demoted Jang, banished her and her brother, and then he brought back the original queen. Meanwhile, Yeo Jong, Yeo Jong's older brother, was king. He was sickly and airless. So just in case, Yeo Jong was made the royal prince successor to handle the state affairs. Yeo Jong takes the lead once his brother finally kicked the bucket. During his 52-year reign, Yeo Jong accomplished a number of important reforms in various fields, including political organization, culture, and industry. Born in 1735, his son, Prince Sato, was bullied by him a lot. He'd publicly humiliate him and abuse him. Sato suffered from delusions and nightmares from the age of 10, and things just got worse as he grew up. His constant quest to impress his father drove him to madness. His reaction to losing his stepmother and grandmother in the same month sent him over the edge. To say he didn't take it well would be a gross understatement. He beat the Anuks. He killed palace staff. He bagged a nun, somehow, tried to seduce his own sister, and assaulted several ladies in waiting. In one instance, he walked into his room holding a recently severed head of an Enoch who he just killed. Then he forced anyone around to look at it, including his own wife. When his father found out what his misdeeds were, he summoned him to the court, locked him in a giant chest of rice, and after eight days, Sato was dead. Next. Let's look at self-sabotage to the max. Wan Li, the 13th emperor of China's Ming Dynasty, had two official concerts and a whole bunch of B-words. That's a fun way to say he had a lot of concubines. His mother was Empress Dowanga Li, once an imperial maid who had no political resources to manipulate. She worked her way up to empress, where she developed a romantic relationship with Zhang Zhusang, who was an extraordinary prime minister and reformers in ancient China and brought about the last great reign of the Ming Dynasty. She trusted him to teach the young Wan Li, and when Zhang passed away, he left a great empire with efficient management system, wealthy and stable civilians, peaceful borders, and no threatening enemies. Once, the Wan Li emperor slept with a maid and had an heir, but then homeboy fell in love with the imperial concubine named Zhang Now, his mama pitied service Wang and forced Wan Li to give her the royal title, thus the heir to the throne. Wan Li said, nah, I want Zhang's baby, my second son, to be the heir. This controversy lasted for 15 years, countless intense debates were conducted, and over 300 intelligent officials were resigned, demoted, put to death, or exiled. But the emperor's ministers wouldn't stand for his son, Wan Li's third, as heir. And Wan Li was forced to declare his first son by the consort, Lady Wang, as the crown prince. So, 
He stopped working. For the last 20 years or so of his reign, he was like a modern day politician. Feet kicked up, head in the clouds. In a passive aggressive protest, Wan Lee spent decades ignoring meetings, memorandums, and other royal duties. Unsurprisingly, this undermined the country. Many historians attribute this to the crumbling of the Ming Dynasty in 1644. And last on the list, the tale of two brothers. In 1527, the Inca king Hayana Kapak died and decided to just leave his kingdom to his two sons, Atahuapla and Huascar, to duke it out in a serious family meltdown moment. The two men had different mothers, as Inca rulers took multiple wives and concubines, so they tried the dual leader thing, but they just couldn't see eye to eye. They did what any disagreeing adults do. In 1529, a war broke out. Things got personal. Atahuapla apparently at one point drank out of the skull of one of his bros generals. This Inca civil war would hurry along the downfall of the great civilization and aid in the erasure of its history because in 1532 Francisco Pizarro, Spanish conquistadors arrived to erase some history and culture and they appeared right as Atahuapa was declaring victory over his brother who he'd captured. Pizarro invited the Incan ruler to come down to the great square of Cajamarca. Because he didn't know how the whole colonizer thing went down, Atahuapa agreed and brought 80,000 people with an unarmed inner retinue to show good will. Meanwhile, the Spanish had armed men hidden everywhere, and a friar from the Spanish side offered the leader a Bible, which he didn't even know how to open or read. When asked to accept Christianity, he didn't, because a stranger was offering him something he couldn't understand. Because he refused, the Spanish jumped out of hiding and attacked the unarmed contingent. Atahuapa was captured and eventually executed, though not before he was able to get out an important order to his people during his capture. Don't forget to execute my brother. Thank you so much for watching, you guys. I hope you enjoyed snooping in some family drama. I'll see you next time, but until then, be sure to like, subscribe, and comment down below.